VS Code. Love it or hate it, it's become the norm for quite a while now. I still remember working at Twitch being the one person who just would not give up on Sublime Text. When I started writing more unit tests for weird TypeScript functionality, I was introduced to the VS Code debugger by a coworker, which was a huge help in me running the tests and playing with things as I went along, and ended up slowly making the shift as a result. That all said, I missed the performance. While I could sit here and defend Electron all day, I'll admit the performance is something you feel in a text editor. While VS Code is way faster than alternatives were like Atom, you definitely feel that it's a browser, not a native editor. And when you use something like Sublime Text or even things like Vim, the speed at which a key press results in a key being on your screen, it's small, but you feel it. And I definitely understand why people miss a native IDE. This is why I'm really excited to talk about Zed today. Zed's a really interesting editor because it's trying to find balance between native performance you would expect from things like Vim and a plugin UI focused ecosystem similar to VS Code, where you can kind of get the best of both worlds. It is not just being created by some random people, it's actually being built by the original creators of Atom. And those Atom creators didn't just invent one of the first modern text editors, they actually built Electron just to make Atom possible. In a lot of ways, you can almost see this as an undoing of the damage that Electron did, where this team wants to make a much better performing editor that doesn't compromise on the user experience the same way other things might do. Now, Zed is open source. This is a huge change that I honestly didn't expect because Zed's a startup. They have to make money somehow. Open sourcing their editor is a bold decision to make. But not only are they open sourcing, they actually rewrote most of the code in the process. So why the big rewrite? Last week was my first week at Zed. I joined right as the team was preparing for this week's release, which they referred to as Zed2. Big things in the air. This release marks the end of the team's multi-month rewrite of Zed's UI framework, GPUI, from V1 to V2. All hands on deck, everybody fixing the last bugs, polishing Zed, and I, the newcomer, had so many questions. Why the big rewrite? How'd you pull it off? What does this get you? How do you organize it? This is really cool that they're like publishing this type of stuff about why they're doing these bold rewrites and that the whole video is on YouTube as well. I'm not here to talk about the rewrite though. I'm here to talk about the open source release and actually play with Zed a bit. If you want to hear more about big rewrites like this, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll make a whole video just about this rewrite. We're excited to announce that Zed is an open source project. The code for Zed itself is available under a copy left license to ensure any improvements will benefit the entire community. GPL for the editor, a GPL for server side components. Interesting that they went with standard GPL for the editor and the Apache modification of it for the server side stuff. Makes sense for them to make sure they have a business they can sell, but fascinating to see this type of like split licensing for a product. If you think I should talk more about licensing for open source, let me know because it's the thing I have a lot of weird opinions on. They also mentioned the GPUI rewrite that they are distributing as well under Apache. So anyone can use it to build high performance desktop apps and distribute them under any license. That's huge. That's really cool. Go to open source. Why are they doing this? Most importantly, they believe that making Zed open source will make it the best product. Our mission is to build the world's most advanced code editor and get it in the hands of millions of developers. There's a ton of surface area on the platform and we'll need all the help we can get. Considering that all of Zed's users are programmers, it makes the most sense to open Zed to the maximum pool of talent. This is a really good point. Since everyone using Zed is going to be a developer, letting them contribute to it makes a ton of sense makes a ton of sense. Really cool to see them thinking in this way. On a more selfish level, we also think going open source will be a lot more fun. One of our favorite aspects of software is connecting with people. We're not only proud of what we've built, but also how we've built it. We want to share Zed's inner beauty with all of you, and we're confident we'll learn a lot from you in the process to make it even better. They're also introducing this idea of fireside hacks, where you can hang out with people in the Zed channels, talk with other developers, people contributing, people not, and they'll be running fireside hacks in them where they work on Zed live in a public channel. This is super cool. I love these like community opportunities to hang with people. Really nice stuff. And then they talk about the money aspect because this is important too, because they're a startup, they need to make money eventually. And they say specifically that they strongly believe the best way to build and maintain the world's best editor is by associating it with a sustainable business model. It's the only way they can continue to invest in a full-time team to spearhead dev. Some may wonder if making it open source undermines that objective, but they've thought about it a lot and they don't think the openness is at odds with the commercial success. Rather than selling you a proprietary editor, we'd much prefer to sell you services that seamlessly integrate with your editor to make you and your team more productive. Said channels is just one example. It's free for anyone today, but they intend to begin charging for private use after a beta period of experimentation. Providing server-side compute to power AI features is another monetization scheme they're seeing getting traction. And I've seen this more and more with companies recently where they're trying to become a standard first and then monetize later. I think it works really well. I'm curious to see how it goes for an editor. Nobody's really tried this at this integration level. Usually editors either charge or don't make money. Charging later to make money is an interesting strategy that requires more investment for them to find success, but seems like they're building something really special here and I'm excited to see how it goes for them. They're not at 1.0 yet though, so no, this is still early, but it is a really exciting rewrite. I wanna play with it. So I guess there's something else to do other than click this download button. So let's do it. Download for macOS. One more thing of note, at this point in time, Zed is Mac only. They do plan to support other platforms in the future, but 
let's be honest, with the things that they're targeting, Mac devs are gonna be the majority of users anyways, and they'll certainly be the majority of potentially paying users in the future. So as a business tries to figure out if they have something with traction that could possibly make money in the future, it makes a ton of sense that they're not supporting Windows and Linux just yet. Anyways, here is Zed. One of the cool things, they actually have a Vim mode built in. Does that mean this is officially Primogen approved? to be determined. I don't have Vim bindings in my head anymore, so I'm not going to check that. They really thought of the setup process here where you can pick a theme. Doesn't seem like they have the Poimanders theme. I don't know if you can install custom ones or not, but they don't have my preferred one, which makes sense. It's a pretty niche theme. So let's go with the default for now. She's a key mapping, VS Code. Yes, please don't make me learn new things. It's cool that they let you take the mappings from other programs and the default is VS Code where they're just copying the VS Code key bindings. Really good idea. Don't make me learn all of these other new things when I'm just trying to play with a new editor and then install the CLI. We'll take a look at the upload thing, public code base. So cool, here's our project. It is very minimal. I've seen people saying that already, but I do like how, how muted things are. I don't love the lack of color in the icons because like I can mentally map things when they have color, but it's also like almost everything's just TS, 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 TS in blue. So how much does that really matter? Debatable. I don't know if you guys know this, but the VS Code CLI is slow as shit. So if I type code period, we're gonna press enter right now. And that took like a second plus to switch over. I actually have a custom binding that you might have seen me use C that is an alias that just calls the VS Code application directly. And when I do this instead, I'm gonna press enter right now. It's literally instantaneous. And as silly as it seems to care about that, this lets you load the application way faster. And the specific CLI thing they're using to get those args and parse them is just not very fast. Let's start by playing with the hotkeys. That worked great. Is there a hotkey for hiding and showing the sidebar? Command B. That's snappy. Scrolling feels a little jank. I don't know how much this will come up like in the recording because I'm recording 30 FPS even though my screen's running 120. But the scrolling feels less good. This is actually something I noticed when I first played with Zed is that scrolling felt a little weird. Yeah, a ton of inertia. That's a good way to describe it. Vim Tim in chat. So love that a Vimmer has opinions on this. One thing that really annoys me in VS Code is when I'm trying to delete like a section of text. So let's try and delete here up to functions because when I go here, it scrolls too fast. This is way better for that already. It's a small thing, but these are the things I want to test because I want to see what my day to day is like in this editor. Let's say I want to delete everything from line 122 to like 200 something. Let's say to 205. How easy is it for me to get to exactly 205? That was pretty easy versus in VS Code. We'll start at 122 and I want to get to exactly 205. And it scrolls way too fast, no matter how far you go. And it's a good bit harder. I've had a lot of annoyance with that. Why not scroll down to the line and shift click? Because I don't think that far ahead. Probably a good call. Oh, look at that. They light things up bright green when there are changes in Git. Okay, am I crazy or does that icon look like source control to you? Because this icon looks to me like source control, not like files. I might be insane, but that looks like a source control icon with the branching. How fast does the Git update? That's a good question too. And let's see what happens. That was instant. That was instant. Good shit. Yeah, VS Codes is not anywhere near that fast. Now all these things are staged. You can't even see it in VS Code. Commit dash M init commit. And VS Code doesn't update these things in the background. In order to see the update, I have to go back here and then it will update. But I bet some older files, oh no, it updated everything. I'm sure all of you that use VS Code really hard have had the problem where it doesn't see certain things have been commit, some things haven't been commit and it just yells at you the whole time. Didn't do it there. I've experienced it a lot. I know y'all have too. It's really cool that Zed does not seem to do that and is like weirdly immediate. I don't love this icon. What is this? Move to a new file. I don't love that UI. Don't know what this does or is for. It seems like probably one of their weird AI things, but can I see if Zed supports auto rename tag? Interesting thought. Let's first off test the TypeScript. Go to definition. Here's our TRPC proxy client. Let's rename symbol to internal API. Rename. No, there's no like confirmation button or something. I would assume there'd be like a button at the bottom here that says go nuts. What is this mad about? Why why is this upset about the type definitions? Oh, it's the ESLint. I think the ESLint is out of date, but the TypeScript isn't. Because you can see here, I have the type definition, but ESLint is saying it's an unsafe assignment of an any because ESLint didn't get the change that we have a different name for this thing, internal API now. Very interesting. Very interesting. I have saved the changes. They've been saved in all the files that I did them in. So basically they also get this sync issue in VS Code. I get the issue where I have to reset the TypeScript server, but usually the ESLint server catches up. ESLint being broken separately is new to me. Is there a reset? 
There's restart language server. Oh, it looks like while I was doing that, this corrected itself. Interesting. It might've been because I hadn't opened this file since the change and it was caching that editor level. I can't know any of this for sure. The goal here is just to like play with it and see which quirks it does or doesn't have. If I should actually commit to using this editor for a bit, again, let me know in the comments and I'll give it a shot for a little longer. Other people are saying they often have to reset ESLint more than they have to reset the TypeScript server. Very interesting. Someone else pointed out it's cool you have ESLint support out of the box. I absolutely agree. Having ESLint to TypeScript and all of this without any plugins, because like I don't have any plugins installed in this. I don't have anything installed right now. Like here are my settings. There's nothing. Let's try some other fun things, more TypeScript quirks. I should be able to command click hello and get to the TRPC function in the server folder. And it works. Dope. Having that type of deep type inference is essential for any editor that I use. So if I'm in some client or like user facing code and I want to quickly do anything, like I want want to just figure out where this is coming from or like make a change to what it's returning. Having command click working here is huge. And the last time I played with a Z, this was not working. Previously, it would bring me to weird places in like my type definitions for TRPC itself. Now it actually goes properly all the way to the place where this is written. Hopefully it still does this on client components. One way to test that. It still does. Good stuff. Should I actually try typing now? Because thus far, I have avoided actually editing in the editor. Let's see how this feels. This is a test to see how typing here feels. Overall, I'm impressed. The auto comment continuation is also a nice touch. I don't know if you guys saw that. It's hard to see because I don't have my key presses on screen. But when I press enter, it continues the comment for me. That's really nice. It's doing some type of auto formatting here too. Not quite as much as I would have liked. But let's see if I tab this out. That looks like it's doing prettier stuff properly. Mark pointed out there was a lot of pop-ups when I was typing here. When I wasn't typing it in a comment, there was. But it seems like when I'm in a comment, it chills out. But when I'm typing here, this is a test typing. Yeah, the um, the spam of like it trying to autocomplete shit is a little annoying because it's so fast that it does it quickly. But it just it flashes all over the screen when I'm typing. Like, do you see how annoying that is, that would piss me off so much. I would just add a debounce to that. So when I type a letter, you don't prompt me with that until I've waited for at least a few milliseconds. That I also find this really annoying, especially when I'm making content, because I'll be typing something and just my screen's flashing all over the place and it makes the video super distracting. So for me in particular, that's kind of a no-go. Yeah, also the dialogue should be smaller, people are saying it's pretty big. I will say I, I'm on a 720p effective screen when I'm doing content, so I don't know if it's less bad in other cases, but right now it's taking up a ton of my screen. That said, VS Code sucks about this too. And I type TRPC, like it still starts to do things, but it's nowhere near as brutal about it. The <laughs> JSTS server immediately crashed five times. Great sign. Responsive test. This is me getting a gut feel of the responsiveness in VS Code. This is me getting a gut feel of responsiveness in Z. I'll be honest, guys, doesn't feel much better just typing like that. Does that come off in the video? Does this seem faster? Because it doesn't feel very different to me. Curious if that quirk would still happen in comments. What will happen here? I am adding, cool, it does not. So when I press single quote or double quote, double quote, it will automatically double up, but single quote, it won't because a single quote might be a contraction, but a single quote here doesn't necessarily know that and it always doubles it up. So when I'm doing I am, now M is surrounded, even though it's in a comment. So kind of annoying that when I'm typing a comment, I have to go through and delete a bunch of things it's randomly adding for me. I'll be honest, I've always been annoyed when you make a tag and it auto closes it for you. I don't want that on single parens in a comment ever. But in general, I've never been a big fan of it. So I am biased there. One of the really interesting things that Zed's trying to do different is focus on collaboration. Most editors have some crappy plugin where you can share an instance. And I'll be honest, every time I tried, it was a jank experience. I've never had a good time using VS Code with two people on different computers. And usually I just prefer to screen share in Discord or something. I am curious how this works with multiple people working in one thing together. First off, there's a chat, which is actually really nice to have a built in live chat. They have a concept of channels where I can create a channel. If anybody has Zed, let's try it. We're going to make a t3.gg channel. It wants my microphone. Is there a, a way I can mute that? Oh, there it is. It's in the top right corner. Very interesting to have AV built into the editor. Also a share screen option. So I can share my screen beyond just the editor. So if I want to showcase like what I'm actually working on, like I want to showcase what the, the browser does in the background while I make changes. Really cool that it supports that. Can people join the t3.gg channel? Is this public or private? How does this work? Cool. I trust you, Yash. I don't want to call you. No, I'm sorry. I did not think just clicking your name would call. 
that's uh, unintended. I am sorry. I don't know how to stop calling either. There's no way to do that. Remove contact. Yeah, she's on a call. Yeah, the UI for this is a little jank. I do not like that I can accidentally call somebody by clicking on their name. Like call things should should at least have like a separate button for it. There's no right click behavior at all. Like I'm right clicking on people and doesn't do anything. I just don't get this. Join channel. None of these things appear to be doing anything. It still has me calling Yash, and I don't know how to, to stop that. Does revoke right access do it? No. Unshare. Leave call. Okay. That was dumb. On the channel, invite members. Oh, I can just make it public. And now you have been invited, Agor. There's join channel and open channel notes. Oh, okay. The channel notes is this thing in the middle here. So we can save like a markdown doc. Notes. Hi, friends. Igor, are you able to edit those notes? Is this safe though? Can you run a terminal command? Fantastic question. Oh, hi from Agor. Hi, Agor. Do you have access to my terminal here? Let me try. Can't open my terminal. Can you see what I type in it though? You have your, yours open. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm very curious how much you do and do not have. You can't even see it. Interesting. I have mixed feelings on this. On one hand, it's actually pretty cool to think about your coding environment as a, a shared collaborative place. Can you see that you're on your project? You already did Zed Club at work. It's fun. Oh, interesting. I have mixed feelings on this. It's a really cool idea to have good collaboration tools baked into your editor. It gives you a ton of opportunity to innovate in ways like a plugin simply can't. And I like the idea that it's not a plugin for this. Like the VS Code Live Share plugin, despite being somewhat baked in, is pretty jank. This, despite being early and jank feels like it has more potential to integrate deep in and I am excited to see where it goes but the UX is rough like the fact that when you click someone's name it starts a, an audio call with them in my editor is terrifying to me I hate that that's that's not something I can support like ever and I will probably be disabling this feature until there's like a major update I want to better understand what the AI autocomplete experience is like oh I can sign in for copilot here cool copilot is enabled Look at that. We got Copilot working. Dope. Pumped that even though they have aspirations to do their own AI stuff, that Copilot is already built in and working as I would expect. That's dope. It's nice that I don't feel the need to run and grab any plugins. There are little things that I've been using a lot in VS Code recently that I like. I go through my extensions. Obviously, having language things like um, Astro and such is really nice. I love Cloak for hiding secrets. Dino is nice to have support for directly. They already have ESLint built in. They have Copilot built in. Haven't played with their Git stuff. I'm not a big Git in the IDE person, but a lot of other people are, so that'll be missing, which is notable. The things I've been thinking about, though, Obviously, my themes, I love the Point Manders theme. It'd be really nice if they had a way to import VS Code themes because it's like a standard-ish syntax. Somebody will probably hack that or at least make a converter in the future. It seems like it's doing all the prettier stuff for me already, so that's cool. The two I was thinking of that I'm going to miss are pretty TypeScript errors and QuickLint.js. These two plugins are very good. I already have a video for pretty TypeScript errors. Yeah, TypeScript just got so much better. If you want to know more about the pretty TypeScript error plugin, check the video out. It required a ton of hacks by the dev to make it work, but the result's super cool, and I rely on it a ton. You can see here that it will actually make you this nice printed out formatted error thing instead of the absolute mess that TypeScript normally gives you. Super, super cool. And then QuickLint, if you're not familiar, I haven't made a video about this yet. It checks for a bunch of basic JavaScript and TypeScript things, like using an equals accidentally in an if statement, awaiting something that isn't async, little type errors that are pretty common. And it's super, super fast. So you get feedback like immediately, which is really cool that like on each character, you're getting feedback. I've been enjoying QuickLint quite a bit. And again, let me know in the comments if I should do a whole video about QuickLint because it is a pretty cool project. But in order to care about those things, we first need to see how Zed handles when you do something wrong. So let's spell post wrong. How quickly when I add the T will I no longer have a type error? Pretty quick. And if I have the type error and I hover over, oh no, it's the super unreadable type errors. Also, if you notice, I get different type errors depending on how far in I am, because these are all accessing an unsafe any. I don't know if VS Code is smart enough to not do that, but there's only one way to check. So over here, we get the nasty TypeScript error, but then we get the much better formatted error from the pretty TypeScript error plugin. However, these further down things, now this is all the unsafe any. Yeah, cool. So 
equally bad there, but at least I can use my plugin here, which I cannot use in Zed. In my opinion, if Zed's goal is to make something better enough than VS Code that we all start switching, these types of UX wins are a really big thing if you can do them. Because if you produce enough of these wow moments for a developer that might not know about these plugins, might not know about these other things, this can be a huge, huge win for building like positive sentiment and getting them to go show it to their friends and getting me to talk really positively about it in a video, all those types of things. Seeing if there is, do they have any plugin system at all? I don't think they do. Not upset with it in any way. One more thing we should probably test is auto importing. What's something I can import? Okay, we have the create post. Deleting this component, deleting the import for this component. Let's try mounting it now. The flash of that is so annoying. And also that all these MDN references come up before my own code. Like I have to press arrow down how many times to get to my thing. And also the width of this changes. That's jank. That feels not good. That all like this UI shifts around as I try to get to the right thing. And that what I'm here for is so low priority. I have to type the whole word create. And even just typing create, it still has credentials container, canvas capture media, and all these other things that don't start with create because the fuzzy search sucks. Create, all those letters are in order in credentials container. It has the letters for create in order, but something that starts with create should be first, for sure. This is shit. These are the little things that like are hard to get right that will be fixed over time, but feel jank right now. And if the goal of something like Zed is to offer a meaningful user experience experience improvement over VS Code, these things matter way, way more. So that's a little disappointing. If I click it, did it auto import correctly? It did. Cool. So at least the auto importing works, but the ranking there was terrible. I'm happy I checked that. One good one is .env. This is a new project, so this won't leak anything, but it looks like it would have if I hadn't like been sure that it's good ahead of time. Is that a, a, a no copilot icon? Something I have to rely on is the ability to hide secrets with something like Cloak, because there's nothing worse than accidentally exposing your secrets on stream. If I go to here, I can turn on Cloak, and now you'll see all the secrets are hidden. Very, very useful. And I try to turn this on before I stream code so that I never accidentally leak environment variables. Again, these things are small, but enough of them add up. And one of the things you need in order to win with a challenging new product like this is you need to win sentiment from the people who can spread that and share that sentiment. So I, as a, a creator with reach, as dumb as it is that I'm saying you should prioritize my quirks and my needs, because most users won't benefit that much from having their secrets auto hide. It makes me more confident when I use it to make content, which then reaches the users you want to potentially have. This is the thing I've been talking with a lot of companies about, especially when I'm consulting. It's the idea that targeting creators, despite their weird needs, that might not overlap with your users. It's actually a really powerful tool to hit product market fit earlier and get your product in front of others earlier. There's two reasons. One, we have the reach. So if we can use the product, we'll reach that audience. But two, and arguably more important, if you can't win us, you can't win our fans. Creators and influencers in these spaces, especially nowadays, deeply understand the things that their viewers and their audience want to use and work with. We might be pickier, but we're also more understanding and we're more willing to have these conversations and hear these things out. And I've regularly been surprised at how much value I and other creators can bring to companies by giving feedback on the product and why we would or wouldn't use it. We are kind of a representative minority of the space because in order for us to get people to watch our videos, we have to understand what they like and what they resonate with. And with that deeper understanding, we're often positioned to, to give better feedback. And also we spend more time thinking about what our audience would like. So if you can't convince us to use your thing, despite us having that mindset where we can think kind of the way all of our different viewers think and all the different groups, Groups. And if you can't convince us that it's good enough for one of those groups, it's going to be really hard to convince them yourself. So again, I feel bad saying make the things creators want, but if your target audience is the people who watch those creators, making them happy can help a ton. I will say I'm impressed, especially when you consider that they don't get to lean on much existing work here. Like they have tree sitter. In fact, the tree sitter devs are some of the core team for Zed. They have the TypeScript language server running in the background and allowing them to get all the data they need here. But they are missing a lot of the pieces that exist because of the size of the existing VS Code and JavaScript ecosystem. Like another thing people just brought up is the tailwind autocomplete. Oh, wow. Looks like they hard coded the tailwind autocomplete in. It's PT. This I don't love. Like weird things get mixed into the autocomplete, but at least that works. Does it have the hover to see the actual CSS that applies? It does not. Interesting. And does the prettier organizer organize things correctly? It does not. Okay. So this is again, like because they can't lean on the existing tools, they have to build their own versions of it. So we do get a lot of the tailwind autocomplete help here, which is really nice. Like I can tailwind like group 
or Tailwind, like LG, P, whatever. And it's smart enough to know what that is, but it doesn't let me hover over to see what these things are. Versus in VS Code, I hover over one of these and tells me the exact class there. Another thing it doesn't seem to support that I push really hard is the auto sorting prettier plugin for Tailwind, which makes your Tailwind code way more readable because everything's in the same order. I intentionally put this padding too far forward because now when I save, it's gonna get moved to the right spot, which is in this chunk in either the middle or the end, depending on which classes you have, that has all the padding behaviors. I've learned this order. It's really good. The prettier auto sort Tailwind plugin is dope. And I genuinely think everyone should be using it if they're using Tailwind. So not having that sucks because they didn't implement prettier bindings. They implemented a bunch of prettier's functionality into their editor. They didn't implement the Tailwind plugin. They implemented a bunch of Tailwind's functionality into the editor. This is also why open sourcing is so important because if they didn't open source, building and maintaining all of these things becomes really, really difficult really, really quickly. And I'm hopeful that the choice to open source will make it more likely the community supports these things going forward. That said, if the Tailwind stuff is written in Rust, I'm curious to see how that goes. We can check the source code quick though. Interesting, they have the Tailwind Prettier plugin package. It should work then. Although if you think about it, it's pretty wild to see Tailwind and Prettier in the source code of Zed, especially when you compare to like the VS Code GitHub. If we search in here for Tailwind, nothing. Search in here for Prettier, they might use it but it's not part of VS Code itself because these are all plugins that are external extensions. Whereas with Zed, these are all built-in features in Rust. I don't necessarily love this, but open sourcing is a huge step in making future extensions that are more usable. Also, how hilarious is it that Tailwind's considered a language? The point stands, having to support things that deeply in your editor is a scary thought. And the amount of work that the poor Zed team has had to do to create all of these bindings is a little terrifying. Oh no. Oh no, I see what they're doing. Since Tailwind's a subset language, not a proper language, which obviously Tailwind's not a programming language, in order to get their autocomplete and their adapter working in all the other places you might use Tailwind, they had to manually bind the Tailwind parser to every language you might use Tailwind with, including but not limited to CSS, Elixir, Hex, Hex, I've no idea what H-E-E-X is. TSX, JavaScript, HTML, ERB, Svelte, PHP, and more. Reference is coming up there. But yeah, the, the fact that they have to bind Tailwind hard-coded to every single language for it to work is incredibly not extensible. And again, with like not having plugin support for other things like Tailwind to exist or for Tailwind changes to happen, or God forbid Tailwind version four has different classes than Tailwind version three, you're fucked. The fact that these language parsers have to have such weird additional assignments made for it to work is scary. Also, like the first line in the language init is an Elixir settings register. So Elixir has to do some special things and they always run this code even if you're not using Elixir. So these types of hacks are necessary when you don't have a plugin system. And they're a little scary. That said, they did just open source this code and I'm not here to just shit on people's code. Like this isn't bad code. It's scary to maintain as an open source project. And that's a thing we should think about and be honest about. They do have a plugins directory. Interesting, for child and children, if okay, path child path config, read language config. If it matches, then they register it. Interesting. Yeah, and they're registering it through a WASM layer too. That means they can safely run Rust code in like a virtualization layer. And also they can run other languages, including JavaScript and TypeScript. This is very interesting how this is architected. I'm even more excited about reading through how that rewrite worked. So again, let me know in the comments if I should make a video about the whole rewrite. The file for all the language support, including loading plugins, is under 300 lines of code. That's not too bad. Enough of you have pointed out that GPUI is cool that I'll quickly touch on it. It is actually really interesting. The goal of GPUI is to do a GPU accelerated UI framework written in Rust so that you have Rust code that runs native UI. There hasn't really been anything like this before, at least that I know of. They've stated a lot of their goals here and actually really surprised the quality of what they've written here. They point out their three different registers that they've created depending on the way you want to build this UI. Interesting. This is Swift UI. I know most of y'all aren't Swift UI users, but this is Swift UI. <laughs> this is the Swift UI syntax. Look familiar? Yeah, that is fascinating to me. I haven't talked much about Swift UI and I have a lot of opinions, but I think they, they took the right lessons from React and it is interesting to see other things doing it. I am very curious about the decision to use div here as the example. Is Zed using a web container that's rendering divs or are they rendering native UI? Wasm's not a UI layer. It has, like, if this is running 
in a browser shell, this is would be Wasm. Doesn't I don't care about how, where it's running. I care about what it's rendering to. Does this render to some type of extension of a canvas or a DOM, or is this making native UI with like GPU calls? Because they pointed out that it's GPU accelerated, a GPU accelerated UI framework for Rust. Create a new window with app context, open window, and register your first view. There is nowhere near enough info here. Seems like it's running native. I'm very confused by the choice of using a div in their example, because if you're deep enough in web that you don't, don't know this, divs are a web concept. Even React Native doesn't have a div. Like if you write React Native code, you cannot render a div in it. You have to render a React Native view or text element. Leveraging Rust in the GPU to render user interface at 120 FPS. They're calling out my concern of like divs are slow because you're doing the web layer. Good old Evan Wallace code. If you don't know Evan Wallace, he also created ES Build. This dude is like the JavaScript and JavaScript accessories performance wizard. Y'all remember in my recent video where I said game devs don't appreciate the web and us finding new ways to render and re-render because they're still trying to get text to render. And a bunch of people in the comments were like, you don't know anything about native devs and like performant dev if you think we don't know how to render text or you think that's hard to do. Here's a five page section on why it's not that easy to render text, you stupid assholes. I'm sorry, but like, if you're building native stuff and you're trying to build native stuff for performance reasons, you do have to care about how text renders. And as you see here, it is not easy to do. They also cited the Pathfinder crate, which seems to be the existing Rust UI rasterization layer that they didn't think was good enough for their needs. Fascinating. This is proof they're actually doing native code. They're not doing things in the browser, which makes me really confused about the choice to have like div and flex all in their example, because div and flex are both very web concepts as well as justify center, item center. All these things are very webby. If you have the opportunity to build something new from scratch, I'm a little confused why you'd bring the web primitives. Somebody said they just picked the name div instead of view, kind of, but they also picked flex. They also picked justify center and item center. They're taking a lot of the way we do things in web, which is very interesting and not necessary. React Native took very little from web. They took a bit, but not a lot. And even things like Flex, they, they tried to take, but they, they built them differently. Like it's a, a silly thing, but a really interesting example of how React Native differs from React for Web. By default, React Web flex boxes are horizontal and you have to specify be vertical. React Native flex boxes are default vertical. You have to specify horizontal. It's a, a small detail, but these things add up as you swap between platforms a lot. I'm interested in why they chose to go the web direction here. There's a lot going on in this project and I'm really curious to see where it goes. From the native layer in Rust for the GPU stuff to everything they're doing with Collab and AI, there's an interesting thing going on here and I'm really excited that it's not just happening, but it's now open source. I don't see myself leaving VS Code anytime soon, but I am excited for a future where there's more competition and more innovation happening within our editors. What about you? Do you still use VS Code? Have you made the switch over to Vim? Or are you one of the few remaining Sublime Text holdouts that just won't move yet? I'd love to hear what you're using. If you wanna see me make VS Code even worse, I have a great video in the corner here where I let chat decide what I would do to my VS Code and I promise you it's terrible. See you guys in the next one. Appreciate y'all a ton. Peace nerds.